Good afternoon. Uh, thank, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's a great pleasure. I really enjoyed some of the talks. I had the chance to stay here at the, be here at the conference yesterday a little bit and, and throughout this day and uh, met a lot of really exciting folks and um, really was able to network. Uh, it was really great. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Dr. Robert Schlosser. I'm a psychiatrist and um, I am the director of SPL the Shepard Pratt Lieber Research Institute. So the Shepard Pratt Lieber Research Institute is a new um, non-for-profit organization um, for research that, has, uh, that is located at the Towson campus of Shepard Pratt Lieber, uh, of the Shepard Pratt Hospital system. Um, I would like to take about like 15 minutes now to give you a background about uh, who we are um, what we intend to do and how we intend to do it. Um, so as you know, um, there's a rich tradition of research in the history of psychiatry. Beginning in the beginning of the last century, people like Alois Alzheimer and Emil Kraepelin laid the foundations for um, a biological understanding of psychiatry. Later on, in the 1950s, neuroscience discovered the major neurotransmitter systems, and a lot of this knowledge led to like, the discovery of a lot of the drugs that we're using currently in psychiatry, including lithium with John Cade there in the 1950s, and then uh, antipsychotics and uh, the monoaminergic um, antidepressants. More recently, there's been uh, you know, uh, a series of groundbreaking discoveries in neuroscience and genetics, but they have not yet translated to any major improvements in our everyday psychiatric care. And uh, that's a big problem, because all the solutions that were developed up to, you know, the second bar that we're using today, they're not good enough to address all the problems that we still have. And we have a lot of remaining challenges and unresolved issues. About one third of our patients respond pretty well to the treatments that we have and get better, but another third doesn't really respond completely and still suffers from a lot of symptoms. And we have, at least for the major mental disorders, at least one third of patients that we have to consider treatment resistance, that we cannot really help with the regular treatments uh, that, that current everyday psychiatry is providing. In addition, a lot of our treatments have um, pretty miserable side effects. Minor ones, but some very severe ones. If you just think about um, the metabolic syndrome that, that's induced by the atypical antipsychotics, which are great medications. A lot of my patients um, take clozapine and, and don't want to go off it because it has been so helpful for their psychotic symptoms. Um, but they now struggle with diabetes and obesity, and it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really big quality of life issue for them. And then there's a lot of our patients for which we don't have any really effective treatments at all. It's a lot of like, you know, we don't have any effective treatments for the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. We don't have any really effective treatments for cognition in schizophrenia, major depressive disorders. We don't have any uh, really effective treatments for the core symptoms of autism. So that's a really big problem. Another really huge problem is that about two out of 10 of the patients with severe mental illness commit suicide. And I think that's uh, something that's totally unacceptable. In addition, also completely unacceptable is that a lot of people, due to their mental illness, you know, are incarcerated or homeless or lose their families. So why do we think now is the time um, to utilize and capitalize on groundbreaking research um, uh, discoveries that have been made in neuroscience and genetics most recently. Well, we believe that now is the time to advance this because there has been a major investment in neurosciences um, that has led to really new discoveries over the, just the last 10 years that have changed our knowledge tremendously and have improved technology um, taking, these, taking, taking the abilities of, of this neuroscience and uh, the insight into the brain and genetics to a completely new level. In particular, in the fields of genetics, stem cell biology, 
in data science and information technology. And I think we've really seen a lot of this also at this conference. So let me talk about genetics a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about these three fields to, to just share like the very positive and exciting news and then later talk a little bit about the challenges of translating them into really meaningful changes um, in uh, clinical care and psychiatry. So since the first, um, uh, since the completion of the first um, sequencing of the first human genome in two, 2003, we have um, over the last 10 years um, discovered variations in the genome that definitively increase the risk for many major mental disorders, including autism and schizophrenia. We can also use genetic information to say something about drug metabolism, and I think here we've seen a couple companies that are like in this market now and that try to you know, improve clinical care by providing this information commercially. What's very important to understand is that the cost of, of this technology has tr gone down tremendously, and this has changed the, changed the science dramatically. So in uh, 2003, um, when the first human genome was completed, this cost about $3 billion, and it took 13 years. I talked to my geneticist at the Lieber Institute last week, and he said he, now they can do this in about one week, and it costs a little bit over $1,000 at the moment. But we're expecting that the cost goes further down, and there's even ways of you know, looking just at some aspects of the genome. Um, so for a lot of the tests to get a very good read of almost any information that we want to get costs only about $200. And you can make this cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And again, it's very fast. It, it only takes days. Now, we think that this really um, makes, this, makes this technology much more accessible to the clinic, and we think this really does usher in an era of personalized medicine and psychiatry, where we can take this information to be able to predict treatment response and um, potentially, you know, um, uh, side effects prior to even um, prescribing a medication. Another area um, that has really um, increased the knowledge in, in brain sciences and neurosciences is the area of stem cell biology. Um, the Nobel Prize in 2012 honored the discovery of a technology that allows us to take fibroblast skin cells from anyone and differentiate them back into stem cells. With this technology, we can now, or researchers in, 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 with the right setups, can now take these um, iPS cells, these de-differentiated stem cells, and make any type of tissue that's available in the human body, and even grow tiny little mini organs, such as the brain that you can see on the left side there, um, to interrogate like how um, uh, neurons function in a petri dish, or, or interrogate how brain development works, and we can do this from you know alive individuals. So we can do this from people that have mental disorders that we know a specific genetic setup. We can do this from people that have um, that we know have very good responses to particular medications. In 2011. The, per, the first publication showed that when uh, a group in, uh, in California did this with um, a group of patients uh, with schizophrenia, that when they grow them and they compare them to, to family members that don't have schizophrenia, that the cells um, uh, from the patients with schizophrenia have, have less synapses and less functional synapses when they, when they compare them in the culture dish. The same group just recently, as recent as like last week, published a finding where they could actually show that if they grow these cells from patients that have bipolar disorder, they can differentiate who responds to lithium and who does not respond to lithium by, um, by, by seeing how much these cells fire, have action potentials in the, in the culture dish. And of course, um, there has been uh, tremendous advances in data science and information technology. There has been a massive polarization of information technology and mobile devices, uh, really allowing um, a completely new interaction between clinicians and patients in translational research settings. In addition, 
um, the technology of variable sensors allows us to continuously track specific metrics and analyze them. And that's something that has really not been, like, been there before like this. And we're trying, we, we're going to plan to utilize this technology as well. So SPL is trying to really um, capitalize on these type of discoveries and developments in neuroscience and technology and uh, um, bring them to the clinical care with, with the goal to improve clinical care and psychiatry. Our mission is to develop game-changing treatments using genetics, stem cell technology, data science, and advanced brain imaging right where clinical care happens. We envision a day where we can prevent and cure mental illness, allowing our patients to live fully, productively, and joyfully. And we believe that using this technology, we can do this with like, you know, personalized medicine approaches and, um, and, and leveraging the technologies that, that I've talked about earlier. Shepard Pratt Lieber is the brainchild of two respective leaders in, 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 their, in their respective fields, namely the Shepard Pratt Health System and the Lieber Institute for Brain Development. The Shepard Pratt Health System is the largest freestanding provider of mental health and substance abuse services in the country. We treat over 70,000 patients per year. We have about 12,000 admissions to our inpatient units. And we are constantly, like for the last 25 years, ranked as one of the top psychiatric health systems and hospitals in the United States. We're the largest provider of mental health, substance use, and specialty education services in Maryland. I think that this is a perfect environment to bring research into the clinical care because it has such a wide outreach. Shepard Pratt has 38 programs in 16 out of 24 counties of Maryland. Another important reason why bringing translational research into Shepard Pratt and why this is such a great environment to do this is that we have a lot of highly specialized inpatient and outpatient services. In the two hospitals in Maryland that we have, um, the, the majority of inpatient units are specialized. We have several, we have, I think, three generalized adult units as well, but we have co-occurring disorder units. We have units for psychotic disorders. We have units for adolescents and children with neuropsychiatric disorders, such as autism. We have adolescent and children units for, for kids with behavioral problems and mood disorders. We have trauma-related dis disorder units and a, and a whole trauma disorder-related program. And we have uh, uh, eating disorder unit and outpatient program. And it's not just the inpatient units, also the outpatient units that are sometimes specialized. Shepard Pratt Lieber is located in a building with the new, where, the, where also the new psychiatry program is located. The new psychiatry program of Shepard Pratt is, is, is a, an outpatient program with specialized clinics that treat people with adult, adult people with autism. Um, people with traumatic brain injury, people with memory problems and dementias, and people with co-occurring seizure disorders. The other partner, the Lieber Institute for Brain Development, is an affiliate of Johns Hopkins and is one of the few research institutes in the world that is exclusively dedicated to biological research and psychiatry. The Lieber Institute is um, at the cutting edge of biomedical research with uh, a lot of like, re with, with many faculty members at Hopkins, uh, top-notch geneticists, uh, cell biologists, data scientists, and chemists. It's divided in three units, uh, clinical science, basic science, and drug discovery. And um, they are optimizing, they are optimizing uh, teamwork efforts and cross-fostering of ideas and technology between these units. So Shepard Pratt Lieber is really trying to leverage the strength of its two partners to bring, uh, to bring research into the clinical environment. There are several challenges. I group them into three big categories. One of them is the complexity of the brain. Another one is the heterogeneity of psychiatric disorders. And the last one is many barriers that exist to translation. The first obstacles 
are the com or like challenge is the complexity of the of the brain. We've heard about this a lot during this conference, right? A hundred a hundred billion neurons uh, connecting, forming a hundred trillion synapses. It's just the most complex organ that we that we know of. In addition, it's not that easy to access it. Yeah, not as easy as some other tissues and organs in the in the human body. So Shepard Pratliba is trying to. Um, Address these, address these problems by really like working closely with the LIBA researchers and utilizing the technology that they're experts for. That includes the stem cell technology as well as fMRI and EEG and non-invasive brain stimulation. Um, another problem in translation and in psychiatric research in general is the big, like the, the large heterogeneity of psychiatric disorders. Um, you all heard this several times also during this conference. You know, there's not one schizophrenia. It's many different schizophrenias. And unfortunately, it's very hard for us to get at the biological like subtypes. This is why we believe a lot of clinical trials fail. Um, one, there's, there's two ways of approaching this. The, 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 the one way is like just by increasing data. Shepard Pratt is a great environment because it's such a, such a large health center, so we hope that we can recruit more patients into our research studies. The other thing that we're still gonna have to do because this is not even good enough is we're gonna have to share data with a lot of the other data uh, sharing in, um, initiatives that are out there. And we are set up at Shepard Pratt Lieber to do this. We have the IT infrastructure and the, the technical staff to, to integrate ourselves into, into the big repositories. Another way of addressing this is, you know, to going away a little bit from these DSM-4 diagnoses and utilizing new concepts such as RDoC and, um, um, and utilizing particular other ways and more finer and granular ways of looking at our patients. We are speaking, we are, we are working very closely with our physicians because we think they know the patients best and we do not like to become, uh, you know, like uh, just a research organization where patients are referred to. In all our research pro programs, the physicians that actually treat the patients will be like an integral part so that we're in good and close communication with them. The last challenge uh, for SPL is barriers to translation and I think um, if you can take away something from this talk, that is that this is where we really want to be a think tank and we want to do stuff very differently than we see in most other environments. This little cartoon depicts the, the valley of death, basically the divide between the academic research environment and uh, the clinical care. So we don't just want to bridge this and translate knowledge, we actually want to converge clinical operations and research. We're doing this by using the science of team science and really like establishing through systems engineering work groups where clinicians that work at Shepard Pratt and researchers that work at the Lieber Institute interact. There are several other ways how we can improve this and one of them is we have to standardize outcome measures throughout the whole Shepard Pratt healthcare system. And this can be done by some of the great tools that were like invented by the NIH Blue, uh, Blueprint Initiatives and some of the other translational research initiatives of NIH, including very modern patient reported outcome measures like PROMIS and NeuroQual and the NIH toolbox that I've also seen here at this conference being used several times. And I'm perfectly on time, and I want to, <laughs> I want to um, leave you with this quote and a nice picture of uh, the CEOs of uh, Shepard Pratt, Steve Sharfstein, and the CEO of Lieber, Danny Weinberger, looking at a brain dissection going on at the moment. And uh, the quote is from Goethe, one of my um, fellow Germans, and I think it really characterizes best what we want to do. Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. Thanks. I can take some questions. Are you actually offering neurofeedback at um, Clinically, I'm not aware of anyone sh offering sh neurofeedback at Shepard Pratt, but um, we are. Um, we are planning some projects that utilize EEG 
and um, also transcranial direct current stimulation in a collaboration with some of the um, some people at Kennedy Krieger. That's not di that's not neurofeedback yet, um, but we're setting us you know we're we're setting up with like very with the technology that is required for good neurofeedback, and um, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Hi, I just, I have a quick question. Yes. So you all are a new, um, formation, I guess. Do you have specific projects you're already undertaking right now? I mean, you gave us a really general, you know, broad overview, but do you have a couple good promising projects yes. you want to share? This would have been the slide if I would have not like been perfect on time. Um, we have four projects. We have one project that just started that is utilizing a, a compound that is FDA approved for Parkinson's disorder. Um, but that we believe could also be useful for patients that have traumatic brain injury and mild cognitive impairment. The compound is called Tolcapone, and it's a CUMT inhibitor. So the Lieber Institute has a lot of experience with the dopaminergic system, so this medication improves dopamine specifically in the frontal cortex. So we're gonna um, study basically if this medication can be useful in, in patients with TBI, mild cognitive impairment, and potentially autism. And that's already, this study has started. Um, we're doing this, again, it's not just what we do, it's how we do it. So we do it really in collaboration with the clinicians that work at the neuropsychiatry program. And they're doing some of the assessment scale, and they're getting some um, real feedback. So in, in addition to doing the clinical trial, and this is just an open label clinical trial for now, we're also establishing the infrastructure for the clinicians to understand if the specific assessments that are also optimized for clinical care are useful in their everyday practice. So the patients do some of the patient reported outcome measures like TBI quality of life assessments, and the clinicians will get the feedback so that we can, um, after the patients are done with the study but are interested in continuing with these assessments, they can be used clinically. Um, we have uh, another project that's in the late design phases where we are trying to obtain uh, fibroblasts to build a biobank um, from patients that have autism, adult patients with autism that we know a lot about clinically. And we want to see if we can, you know, come up with some useful ways of, like, getting information from the um, derived neurons. And then we have um, one pharmacogenetic study, which is... Um, uh, taking data from the KD study, pharmacogenetics data from the KD study, so basically the genotypes of patients that were um, in, in the KD study and the, the blood levels of their psychotropics. We're taking this, and we have similar to Genomind or Assurex, we have a computational model now where we can predict if someone needs a specific dose um, adjustment of, its, of the antipsychotic, and from the initial data, we, we believe that this could potentially predict also like outcomes in PAN scores. So we're gonna to try to utilize this on the inpatient units, on the inpatient psychotic disorder units or units that utilize antipsychotics a lot. And then we have um, the one, one, uh, one project that I mentioned that will utilize transcranial direct current stimulation and reinforcement learning in patients with schizophrenia. Um, transcranial direct current stimulation seems to be very, very promising for the population of patients with schizophrenia, not just when it comes to negative symptoms, but also when it comes to cognitive symptoms. It actually seems almost um, have a better effect than in mood disorders, and so we are probably trying to uh, develop a study around this and reinforcement learning. All right, thank you.